Welcome to In Focus. I'm Brian Jackson. My guest is Chris Mooney, Director of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome to the program, Chris. Oh, thanks, Brian. What? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a political scientist by training, uh, and uh, I have uh, taken. The, I've been in um, uh, a faculty member at the Institute of Government and Public Affairs since 2004, uh, and uh, last August I um, took the helm as the director, uh, taken over from uh, Bob Rich, who was the longtime director before me. And um, I have previously taught at uh, West Virginia University, uh, University of Essex in the UK, and uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, my specialty uh, is um, uh, my research area is in uh, state politics, comparative state politics. Uh, I've looked at um, um, uh, legislatures and legislative behavior in particular, and uh, also um, a variety of other things such as um, uh, policy making, uh, particularly with regard to morality policy making, sort of abortion and gay rights and things like that that uh, cause an interesting set of politics that are Inter uh, different and fun to, to, to explore. Let's um, go on to President Obama's mm -hmm. speech at, to Congress um, <coughs> back on uh, January the 28th. Some of the key highlights that I wrote down here from his speech were the minimum wage being rose to ten dollar ten dollars and ten cents. My R my IRA, Army Ranger Coy Rosenberg injured by a roadside bomber in Afghanistan, a roadside bomb, and immigration uh, and executive orders. Mm -hmm. What are your impression? Do you think any of these are going to be acceptable to Congress? Well, um, as I mean, the president uh, himself sort of gave up uh, that, that whole, uh, he said, look, I know you're not going to do what I want you to do, so I'm just going to do it on my own, and, uh, and i.e. by uh, executive orders. I'm going to do what I can, I'm going to, you know, by the bully pulpit and by setting out executive orders. And, you know, there, he can do a fair amount. Presidents are, are pretty powerful in that way. They can direct the bureaucracy to do this and that. Uh, for example, on the minimum wage, he can direct the uh, that federal contracts going forward pay at least ten dollars an hour or whatever it is that they're going to have to pay um, but he understands that the congress is so you know some might say dysfunctional but highly partisan uh, and, and um, sort of in opposition to him especially in the house that it's going to be very difficult for him to get any legislation passed uh, especially something as um, Polarizing really is a minimum wage. I mean, it's very, it's minimum wage increase is pretty popular with the general public. It actually polls pretty highly, but in the Republican Party, uh, there's 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 a str you know there's a strong argument about why we shouldn't be having an increase in the minimum wage, and 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 businesses opposed certain types of businesses in particular, and so. Um, it's, it's controversial enough that he's not going to be able to get it through. Same thing with immigration. Immigration, it's possible uh, that they might be able to uh, find a way to, uh, you know, uh, come to a compromise on it because the Republicans uh, understand, at least many of them do, that uh, they need to broaden their base beyond um, sort of middle class and upper middle class white people who are over the age of 40 if they're ever going to win a national election again. And one way they can do that is by um, uh, appealing to uh, the fastest growing minority group in the country who actually have, uh, you know, to some extent uh, on average have some, you know, close uh, linkages in terms of their uh, policy perspectives. Uh, that is the Latino group. I mean, there's a certain conservative streak in Latino uh, uh, political thinking and um, and that would be you know a pretty good fit with the Republican Party but but they've been seen as uh, uh, bashing illegal immigrants and uh, and doing other things that are not uh, very well taken by that community and so um, 
uh, some of the forward-thinking Republicans say, look, we gotta, we got to get these people on board. We've got to, you know, let's get around this problem and let's help. So it's possible they might do something with immigration, but, uh, um, you know, I think in general with Congress these days, you bet on nothing and the odds are pretty good that's going to happen. Do you see any ever legislation, a major legislation being taken up before the midterm election? Do you think there's any ever key issues that the government or the legislature of the United States uh, might be looking at? Well, I mean, it is, like I say, it's possible immigration might happen. Things move very slowly, so, and especially in an election year. Um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's probably unlikely. Um, they do have to deal with the, with the uh, debt limit, and that sounds like it's going to happen because they don't want to, sh you know, nobody has stomach to shut down the government again because I don't think either party looked too good on that in October. And um, so in election years, um, especially when you've got the chambers controlled by different parties, um, again, bet on nothing and, you know, you'll probably do okay. Now let's go over to uh, Governor uh, Illinois, Governor Pat Quinn. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat Quinn last on uh, January uh, the uh, 29th in his State of the State speech said some key is issues here. Minimum wage, $10 an hour, same-sex marriage, legalizing marijuana, early childhood, er, and early childhood education for children approximately the age of four that they could start going to school at the age of four. And also um, the possibility of casinos, the casino issue coming up again in the state of mm -hmm. Illinois. What, what is your reaction to those things and do you see any, any of the, well of course the same-sex marriage has gone through, the, on, that'll be effective June 1st, legalizing marijuana has gone through. What are your reactions to any of these others, and do you see any other legislation coming up under Pat Quinn? Well, I mean, the legalization of, you're going to constrain it, it's the legalization of medical marijuana, right? You're going to get your, your listeners excited because <laughs> they think they're going to go out and find a, the pot store down the street like they do in Colorado, but uh, that's not going to happen here anytime soon, though some might argue that we ought to legalize it, tax the, he uh, the heck out of it, and, and then maybe that'll solve some of our fiscal problems, right? Right. And, and maybe, maybe people will relax a little bit, too. Uh, but the, um, um, you know, some of these other issues, um, w you know, it's minimum wage increase, uh, that would be a tough one because one of the problems, I mean, it's one thing to raise the minimum wage nationwide uh, because, um, you know, there's these strong borders and to go from, say, Canada to the United States or the uh, United States to Mexico. Uh, labor doesn't flow that easily across borders, as we know, uh, but it does flow easily acro I mean, across national borders, but it does flow easily across state borders. So if you uh, raise a minimum wage to $10 an hour and somebody's wanting to open a fast food joint up in Danville or, uh, or in, um, you know, um, Rockton or something where they're right on a border, maybe they, you know, open it up across the way and, and then they pay their... Uh, you know, their workers ten uh, two dollars an hour or less. That might be a consideration, uh, and so you know, state borders. That's one of the reasons states always have to worry about you know the regulatory environment and 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 various kinds of laws that they pass that might have a bleed over effect. For example, in the old back in the old days when I was young. Uh, Illinois drinking age was I think like 19 you could drink a beer mm -hmm. and Wisconsin and Wisconsin was 18 so kids that were 18 in Illinois sometimes would go to Wisconsin so they could drink and then you know they had these these are so-called blood borders where these kids would be driving back and they'd get killed mm -hmm. in a car crash on their way back home uh, and so and, and and like if you raise cigarette taxes uh, uh, considerably then you know it's eight dollars a pack in Chicago but in uh, Maryville Indiana, it might be, you know, five dollars a pack. Well, maybe it's worth it for somebody in Chicago to, you know, get the family truckster and drive down to Maryville, buy a couple of cartons of cigarettes or cases of cigarettes to save some money, right? So they have to be careful about that, and that's an that's even though there is a strong, it's a it's a Democrats are generally favor increasing the minimum wage. Uh, 
um, and like I said, there's a strong public opinion in that favor, um, those cross-border considerations you have to consider, especially in a time when <laughs> Illinois' economy is really in the dumps. I mean, we've got the highest unemployment by a good way of any state in the vicinity. We're the third highest unemployment I think it is in the, in the country. Uh, and there's this economic argument um, that suggests that if you raise the minimum wage, uh, you'll lose jobs because, you know, on the margins, people can't, you know, if, I, if I'm if i an employer and I could afford to pay somebody $8 an hour, I can't afford to pay, you know, I might, there's some situation where I might not be able to afford to pay them 10 therefore, instead of hiring people, I just won't hire people. You know, that's, a, that's an argument that people make. Do you see any other issues coming up in the 2014 legislature that would be significant except maybe for the casinos? Well, you know, gaming, or as they call it, uh, casino expansions, um, that is an issue that comes up every year. It's, it's, it's like Christmas, you know. It comes mm -hmm. around every year, and then it goes away, and we feel, you know, after, after, it, after it passes, we, we feel sad because it passed. Uh, but, uh, um, and it seems like it gets very close, and then it falls apart under its own ways. It's a tough one because... Uh, you know, there's there's a there's a there's there are people that argue we shouldn't be having him. The casinos that exist don't want more casinos because there's, you know, the if you open up new casinos and the old casinos are going to get less uh, fewer gamblers. I mean, um, the, you know, cannibalizing. There's a you know there's again the argument is that there's a certain limited gambling dollar out there, and and if you have ten casinos, they'll get. A certain number of dollars, but if you have 15 casinos, you're going to get more or less the same number of dollars, but they're split 15 ways instead of 10 ways. And uh, evidence tends to show that there's that's partially true. Uh, for example, when they opened up the Des Plaines Casino uh, a few years ago, uh, the casinos in the area, their revenue went down, but it went down less than the, than the Des Plaines revenue went up, or, or well, from zero. So overall, say those three casinos they made more uh, than uh, the two casinos had before it but they didn't make three times you know mm -hmm. they, they didn't make three times as much so um, if you know they have to figure out where they can put it and, and uh, the obvious place where you can really get some new customers would be in Chicago where you you work with uh, tourists right put it down on Navy Pier where you're gonna get a lot of tourists or or someplace like that and uh, um, uh, but then there's the concern that some lawmakers have that we don't want to give a uh, casino to the city of Chicago, carte blanche, uh, and let them regulate themselves. So, that, you know, the devil's in the details about how you're going to regulate it and what proportion is going to come to the state and so forth. And uh, so, again, on, on gambling expansion, uh, even though it looks tantalizingly close, oftentimes I... I you know, and maybe someday we it will happen, but um, again, I, I wouldn't hold my breath for it. And in fact, I wouldn't hold my breath for almost anything big, because this year, again, it's an election year, so um, you know they don't want to do anything too controversial. And they're all you know they're kind of exhausted, right? They like, legalized gay marriage, and they did all these other things. You know, uh, concealed carry was passed, medical marijuana, a lot of big stuff happened the last few years, and so you know they're probably kind of tired. And, uh, um, you know, it's election year. And, and, and moreover, the big issue is the, um, the fiscal problems of the state, right? And, oh, and oh, not to mention they got done with pension reform recently, too, so that's got to tire them out. But the fiscal problems of the state are so severe. Oh. And, uh, they're, you know, whereas Obama is constrained in doing big things because he's got a Congress that can't act or doesn't want to do what he wants, uh, Quinn is constrained because he doesn't have the money to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we've got to, you know, we've got to cut spending and probably going to have to cut spending and increase taxes in order to deal with the budget gap. Uh, we know we have this temporary tax increase that's coming off in next January. No, nobody on the campaign trail is talking about that too much. Um, and, um, uh, you know, nobody, nobody wants to talk about raising taxes and cutting services during an election year, but that's probably what's going to have to happen. On uh, Thursday, May, uh, January 30th, 
House Speaker Michael Madigan said, came up with a plan, corporate income tax rates, good paying jobs, gain companies' jobs. What's your reaction to that? Is it going to play in with the legislature? Oh, boy. Um, you know, cutting taxes um, in general is uh, popular uh, because nobody wants to pay taxes. And even if, uh, but cutting it for corporations when if they, you know, for example, keep the temporary tax increase on, which is an option, uh, you know, so for individuals, then, you know, that wouldn't be very popular. Cut no. business taxes, but keep other people's taxes high. Um, I, you know, it's hard to know exactly what's going on with that, because as is often the case early on in the legislative process, ideas are floated um, for various reasons, trying to, you know, and, and Mike Madigan, you know, he is, um, He's, he's like the Oracle of Delphi. That's what I think of him as. You know, he speaks very rarely, but when he does, you know, he'll, he'll say three words and there'll be 10,000 words of commentary trying to figure out what it is that he's saying, right? And so we don't know exactly where he's getting at with this, but he's, you know, he's a conservative Democrat. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, this, a lot of people argue that, uh, that oh, yeah. corporate income taxes are, are not, they're not, you know, economists don't like them. Right? They're not efficient and, and uh, you know, they're easy to get out of and so they're unfair because some get out of it and some don't. And I don't know. I think this is one we're just going to have to see what, he, what really is up going on here. Who do you ha see as the best chance of beating Pat Quinn and why? And do you see that happening? Well, yeah, Pat Quinn... I mean, there's you know, a number of things going on here. Number one, we're, uh, we're, you know, on average, the generic Democrat beats the generic Republican in the state because we're, you know, we, we tend in that direction. The demographics of the state favor Democrats on a statewide basis. Uh, and so, the, you know, Quinn's got that advantage to start with in the general election. Uh, but Pat Quinn is also one of the most unpopular governors oh, in the definitely. country. <laughs> Very definitely. Yes. And, uh, you know, if you would have said last summer when his poll numbers were, you know, favorables were down in the 30s, uh, in the low 30s in some polls, um, you would have thought, this guy can't get, couldn't get reelected. But um, since that time, you know, they've done pension reform. Uh, and whether that stands up to Supreme Court challenge or whether you think it's a good thing or bad thing, it's something he can use in the campaign trail and say he's mm -hmm. done. I've solved the pension problem. And I think people that aren't paying attention, you know, they could say, yeah, he did it. Okay, we'll give him credit for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, gay marriage is another thing he can stand up and tout. Uh, there's a constituency uh, that that is very positive for. Um, and the ones that that's very negative for are probably not going to vote for him anyway. Um, you know, and some of these other things mm -hmm. that he's now now can claim his accomplishments that a year ago he did not have. So, um, and also he's, you know, he, thanks to Bill Daly's uh, turn of mind, uh, he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't have a primary can, uh, opponent, which is a place where he could have been, I think, very vulnerable. Uh, but, you know, Lisa Madigan doesn't run, and, and Bill Daly runs, and then, nope, I'm not running. And suddenly he's got a free and clear pass the nomination. So now he's the Democratic nominee, or, you know, undoubtedly will be, even though he does have a not mm -hmm. uh, opposition in the primary. Uh, so, you know, that gives him a leg up. He gets, his, he, he gets a lot of money in his war chest. He doesn't have to blow it in the primary. Um, and uh, so that makes it, makes it look like, to, compared to this time last year, he looks a lot more promising to get reelected than he did. Uh, and um, then you look at the Republican field, and um, what you need to beat a Democrat in this state statewide is a moderate Republican, somebody who mm -hmm. is not on the Tea Party wing or the movement conservative. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the last go around, uh, um, uh, Senator Brady, who was Quinn's opponent in, uh, in, in 2010. He was seen, you know, 2010 was a big year for Republicans. It was the Tea Party election. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Quinn was not, well, I mean, he was better liked than he is now, but he was still, his favorables were very high. And, uh, uh, you know, he was as weak as you as could be, and Brady still couldn't beat him. Why? Uh, not because he is a terrible candidate necessarily, or, but he's, he's just, ideologically, he just is not a good fit for this state. 
Um, so you need somebody like, you know, who you got on the, on, the, on, the, on the slate now. I mean, Rutherford is an example of a guy who is sort of a moderate. He's sort of the Jim Edgar wing of the party. Uh, those are the people that, that can beat uh, a Democrat in a, in, if all conditions are right, if you've got a weak Democratic candidate, and if the Republicans got enough money, and if it's a good Republican year. Um, so, you know, and Dillard, too. I mean, Dillard is flailing around a little bit right now. He's, he's trying to beef up his conservative credentials and a right. couple of things he's done lately, but uh, I'm not sure if that's really uh, helping him too much. And then, of course, the big one that we haven't talked about is Rauner, who is a, basically a wild card, um, super rich, tons of money on the air, but he's un, an unknown quantity to a lot of people, so he gets to define himself. So you would, if you were to choose anybody, it would probably either be Brady or Rutherford, maybe Brady? To, to, that would, that could beat Quinn? Or would run against Quinn, at, or could beat Quinn? Um, I think, I think it's probably, uh, I mean, again, Rauner is a separate case. We have to cut, because uh, he's, he's got a lot of different things going on with him. But of the three, Brady Dillard and Ruthford, I think Dillard Ruthford could give uh, Quinn a, a, a good challenge because I think they're both uh, in that uh, in that sort of Jim Edgar wing of the party, the more uh, non-conservative wing, uh, moderate we should say. And um, you know they run before and and um, uh, you know they've got experience. Um, a lot of you know whether they beat him or not depends on uh, many other factors, like if they can generate the money and what happens between now and the election and. So you might say so maybe forth. maybe Rutherford. Well, yeah, I mean he's the one that's got more money. Dillard doesn't have almost any money anymore, uh, and Rutherford's good on the campaign trail. But of course he's having a little hiccup right now, and we'll see if he survives it. Rauner could beat Quinn too. I mean, I, 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 I in some ways, some respects, he may be the one that's most likely to beat Quinn. But the problem with guys like Rauner, like I said, that's why I set him to the side, is because he. You know, the, basically, he's in this mode, and this is a common mode happening all around the country uh, now, where the rich guy or woman, uh, mostly it's guys, but we had Meg Whitman in California right. last go around, blowing a hundred million dollars of yeah. money. Um, you know, they 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 you know succeed in the corporate world, make big big right. bucks, and then they think, well, you know, I'm. I got so, so much money. I must be smart. Maybe I should be governor, you know, or senator. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then they run, and you just don't know. Sometimes they succeed, but oftentimes they don't. Why don't they? Because, you know, they don't have the temperament for the campaign trail, or they don't listen to their advisors because, again, they think so, they're too smart. Mm -hmm. Or they have a scandal or some kind of thing in the past that comes out that you know doesn't hurt them in the corporate world, but mm -hmm. might. Uh, not look good on so, a campaign flyer. Right. You would say Brady would be the third choice, and either Romner or, or Rutherford would have the better chance. Is that right? Uh, yeah, probably, you know, just on average. But like I say, with Rauner, I mean, he could blow up at, he could blow up, you know, by the time we're done taping this, something could come out about him, and he, and he could be out of it. But uh, because, because, again, because he hasn't gone through this process before. But it, that, we could say the same thing about any of them. But, but the ones that have been through statewide campaigns have had that opposition research done, that have had opponents, you know, hammer them and work on them. Mm -hmm. um, Rauner just hasn't had that yet. But I'll say for all the rich guys that have run and lost in this state over the years, and there's always one or two, it seems like, every uh, gubernatorial cycle, um, he seems to have... Um, the best um, advisors, or he's listening to the best. I mean, they're more strategic. Uh, they seem to know what they're doing more yeah. than any of the other ones yeah. do. And he's got more money than Midas. So right. That and in politics, that's a good thing. Do you see Pat Quinn being reelected? I think it's possible, but I, you know, I, I don't like to make predictions because things, especially this far out, God knows what could happen between them. Oh yeah. You know, he may. You know, he may get hit by a bus, and it may be Sheila Simon that, uh, you know, becomes governor for the last six months, um, which, you know, would be, would be, that would be interesting, and it could possibly happen, or anything could happen, you know, so, uh, I, but I think, I think, you, I wouldn't bet, you know, I wouldn't bet against Pat Quinn now, whereas a year ago, I probably would have. The what? 
I wouldn't bet against Pat Quinn now. Okay. Uh, though a year ago, I probably would have. I okay. say he's got at least an even money shot. Okay. At. What about 2016 presidential candidates on the Republican and Democratic side? Geez, well, um, again, that's even further out. So, I mean, there's all the ones that everybody mentions. Um, and they see, the Republicans seem to be eating their own. Uh, somebody, you know, Ted Cruz looks like a. He's going to be, uh, you know, Ted Cruz, senator from yeah. Texas, Tea okay. Party boy. Uh, looks like he's going to be the darling of that wing, and then suddenly, you know, they don't like him for a while. Rand Paul gets a little run up, and then they don't like him. And, you know, and then uh, Chris Christie uh, is sort of the moderate wing uh, golden boy for a while, and suddenly he's doing something with the bridge, and then he's no good anymore. So they're sort of running through the cycle right now. But I would suspect that the Republican nominee will probably come from one of the governor's mansions. Uh, so a guy like uh, Governor Kasich from Ohio, who is a Tea Party kind of guy, but uh, he's done, you know, he's had good success in, in Ohio. Their employment rates going, unemployment rates gone down and things are looking pretty good. I mean, the, up to the north of us, Scott Walker thinks he wants to be president. I would be shocked if that ever happened. but. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're you know, governors, um, they've got experience as executive branch, they've had to work, generally speaking, across the aisle, and, um, you know, they've got accomplishments. And, and the Congress is just so polarized these days, and, um, you know, it's, it's more difficult. And governors just generally have an advantage. If you look back over the last, you know, few decades, mm -hmm. most presidents have been governors. Right. What about Democrats? Democrats, well, um, Hillary Clinton obviously is the big, uh, the big name, uh, the big presence in that race right now. Um, she's run before and done well. Um, you know, there's the Republicans. I think if she's a, a bit of a polarizing figure, so I wouldn't be surprised if the Republicans would like to run against her because uh, they think they could hammer her on Benghazi and you know, and, and whatever else uh, they can come up with. Um, but, you know, aside from her, um, you know, again, if we look to the governor's mansions, uh, who's done well? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a guy who ran for president uh, back when I was a young man named Jerry Brown, right. uh, who has done a remarkable job in California. Uh, as, a, as a governor out there. And, um, you know, you don't hear about his name being tossed around there too much, but he, he you know, they went from sort of a $35 billion deficit to a surplus this year. So he's yeah, got a lot to say. Joe Biden and uh, John Kerry. Well, yeah, I mean, John Kerry's had his chance, and, and we tend not to, you know, once that's happened, we tend to let people move on to the next person. Uh, you know, Biden, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, he, the substance behind Biden it might be difficult. I think he's, uh, he's, he's, he's sort of liked, uh, but um, uh, what, you know, accomplishments have been fewer and farther between. It's hard to know. He, and I don't even know if he's going to run. Would he run against Hillary? Um, who knows? If John Kerry obtains peace in the Middle East, would he, <laughs> would he be a sure, would he be a sure possibility to be the nominee if he obtains peace? I think if he obtains peace in the Middle East, he'll be a sure nominee for sainthood, uh, you know, St. Francis will <laughs> anoint him, right? And, you know, I mean, it's only how many miracles does it take to become a saint? Well, that would be one for John Kerry, right? Um, yeah, I mean, if he does, he will be, I mean, I actually, I think at that point, um, depending on how he does, uh, you know, maybe the UN would be looking at him. I, oh, yeah. Know, more than, <laughs> that could uh, be. You know, that, that would play better internationally than it would in the U.S., I mean, in terms of a, a credential. Right. Know. Any co closing comments, Chris? Uh, well, I appreciate you having me out, and, uh, you know, it's always uh, fun to talk politics, uh, especially Illinois politics. There's always something interesting going on, so... Chris, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure, Brian. Good luck. All right. My guest has been Chris Mooney, a director of the Government and Institute of Public Affairs at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign.
I'm Brian Jackson. This has been In Focus.